My name is Caitlin Sparks. Um, we are here in Cincinnati. Uh, I am the communication and events manager for Tri-State Trails. Yeah, Tri-State Trails is a, uh, an advocacy organization here in the greater Cincinnati area. We work a lot in this region, but we also work uh, in Kentucky, and Indiana, and Ohio. Um, we advocate for bike infrastructure, but also trails, uh, multi-use trails and we do a lot of consulting as well. So we work with local municipalities to create pedestrian and cycling plans for the city, and then we help them implement that by finding grants and funding, partners that would be beneficial to that work. Uh, and yeah, we're all about mo moving it forward uh, and, and yeah, and advocating for these resources that, that help people get around, recreate, um, get from A to B. Uh, and, and yeah, so making progress all the time. Fantastic, and tell us a little bit about what we're gonna be seeing today. Yeah, so today we're going on a tour that starts in downtown Cincinnati, but we'll be riding across the river to Northern Kentucky. Uh, we're gonna visit a couple of river cities. Uh, we'll, we'll stop first in Dayton, Kentucky. We'll be talking about um, sustainable development, small scale development, uh, restoring historic buildings. Uh, we're also going to stop in the public park, Gillen Park, and see a traffic garden, uh, which is relatively new to the area, but it's such a great resource for our young people. From there, we'll move over to Bellevue. Uh, we'll talk with the mayor there, uh, and he's also going to be talking about community involvement, uh, small-scale development, how small businesses have been encouraged to come into these smaller towns and uh, revitalize the downtown districts. Uh, we'll also be talking about the trail development in Northern Kentucky. There's a big project called the Riverfront Commons, uh, which will ideally connect six river cities with a trail, multi-use trail. Um, and uh, from there, we'll, uh, we'll stop on the Purple People Bridge, which is one of our most frequently used trails. It's a multi-use trail that connects Kentucky and Ohio. Uh, we're gonna talk about how that is such an important corridor for this region. And then, yeah, we'll come back to Cincinnati and drop off our red bikes. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Looking yeah. forward to it. Yes, thank you. Maring Way and we're about to turn into Snail Park, which is an incredible park. Yeah, and this Snail Park features a multi-use trail. You can see people riding scooters, people running, and then there's plenty of space for a group of 30 cyclists as well. And this park has uh, recently won a lot of awards for its landscape design. It's really incredible space. But yeah, we're headed towards the Purple People Bridge. We're gonna be going underneath of the John R. Roebling Suspension Bridge. This bridge is really fascinating and beautiful. Um, John Roebling is the architect and designer of the Brooklyn Bridge in New York. And this Roebling Bridge is kind of like a miniature version of it. Um, it's an old bridge, it was built back in the 1800s. And it's, uh, it's had a few moments where it's needed repairs and the whole bridge has been closed down before uh, in the past to automobile traffic. And then immediately cyclists and runners and walkers started going over it. <laughs> so I'm a big advocate to retire this bridge. Yeah. Uh, yeah, remove cars. I think there's already a weight limit. Um, so big heavy trucks can't, can't use this bridge, which is really best anyway, because there's a, uh, City called Covington, Kentucky, on the on the Kentucky side of this bridge, very residential, walkable community. Um, so yeah, so I'm I'm thinking let's let's definitely keep those big trucks off. Yeah. And sure. and yeah, maybe even like someday. Yeah, and I hear it's it's uh, known as the singing bridge because of the t the noise the tires make on the uh, metal grate. Yes, it's called the singing singing bridge. It's also um, I'm pretty sure. 
uh, the creators of Star Wars, some of the sounds that the, the fighter jets use yeah. in Star Wars. I'm not a huge fan, so I know that somebody would be like, it's called this, it's this yeah, type yeah. of plane. <laughs> but but uh, the sound that those, those planes make was yeah. recorded from the singing of our bridge. Coming up onto the purple people bridge. Yes. What's the significance of the color purple? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> no idea. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, I, there was that movie, the, or I think there's a movie that features like a magical character, the purple people eater. Okay. One eyed, one. Yeah, yeah. Something <laughs> giant purple. Yeah. So we're gonna head over to the walking path. Yeah.
So you can kind of start to get a sense of where the Riverfront Commons Trail will be built in the future. But on this ride alone, we're going through three different cities that all have a different mayor and a different council and a different budget and different priorities. So this trail has been, we're gonna go in this parking garage. This trail has been a complicated one. We'll go to the left here. Complicated one to build just because each of these cities has a little bit different situation. But there's been a um, surge of funding. Uh, the organization that manages the Riverfront Commons Trail was awarded a raise grant last year to invest in this trail and move it forward. I think it was somewhere more than, a little more than $3 million, uh, which is a lot, but you can spend that money fast building trails, especially new trail. We'll make a left, left here. Tight squeeze through the planters. There's all sorts of private property here, um, but there is space. So I just wanted to stop us for a minute. We have a couple of more technical spots where we are gonna go through this parking lot and through a little grassy field. Uh, we're gonna hop off the sidewalk there. There'll be a little uh, space for us to do that safely. And then we'll make a quick uh, hairpin turn right there. So it's a little technical, but you guys can handle it. Um, so maybe uh, you're kind of getting a sense that like we have lots of opportunity to build the Riverfront Commons Trail, which is a project that's been in the works for probably 15 years. Um, last year, the organization that manages the project, they also manage the bridge, uh, they were awarded a little over $3 million to push that project forward. Um, so one thing that's really complicated about the Riverfront Commons Trail, it's, it's six or seven different municipalities working together who have a different council and a different mayor, different priorities, different budget. So it's been you know, a lot to manage to get these cities to build consecutive piece, pieces. So some cities have a little more budget for it, and you'll see that in Dayton, Kentucky. They've made a lot of progress in the last year. Um, where we are riding in Newport, right off of the bridge, that's called uh, Riverboat Row. That'll be a big part of Riverfront Commons in the future. Um, Bellevue, which is where we are currently, has some unique challenges with you know, some of this private property. Um, you know, there's uh, residential homes on the other side here. So it's not as clear where they can build their trail. And they're, you know, they're considering using paths like this uh, to make their pieces work together with Dayton and Newport. Um, but one thing I love this spot right here, this is, um, I guess it's called a paper street on the maps. It exists, but it's closed off. Um, I think it would be a great corridor to continue this trail through Bellevue. I think it's being considered in the plans. Um, but yeah, we'll see the other side of it. It would make so much sense to continue the trail there. So this is, um, this is essentially my work commute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so when we were building the tour, I was like, I know where we can go. Yeah, and here, like, this, this uh, whole apartment condo setup, I think, will make building the trail difficult for Bellevue. Right. So again, like, I feel like this street will hopefully get a road diet. Some of the parking could be removed. Well, as it, is, as it is right now, even if they keep the, tra uh, the cars parked there, uh, it's a very traffic calmed kind of environment. You could do some treatments just to keep the, the volumes down and the speeds down. Yes, it's a low stress street yeah, for sure. Exactly. And yeah, and that's why I use it for my bike commute. Yeah. Nice and quiet, take you through these parks. We'll stop in this park okay. um, a little later. Yeah, I like to remind people that uh, 60 to 70 percent of the Dutch network is that, that form of shared street. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Traffic calmed, low volume, low speed. Wow. So it can be done. Yeah. They do that with uh, what they call clinkers, the, the red paver stones and bricks okay. to slow the motor vehicle traffic down. Sends a message that this is not for cars, it's for people. Yeah. This park to the left here, Bellevue Beach Park, one, the cottonwoods are epic. Um, they're ancient, such big trees. And two, um, that park does flood. 
And I see we have some wayfinding signs already out. Yes. For the Riverfront Commons. Yes, and that's one of the things that I think South Bank Partners is wanting to spend, we'll make a left here, is wanting to make a, spend a little bit of money on is better wayfinding and a, uh, an updated brand. Um, and while I think that is important, yeah. yeah, there's, there's, yeah, again, we were talking about how $3 million can be spent pretty quick. Yeah. You can really make that three million stretch, though, if you do, you know, convert a lot of existing infrastructure and focus on, you know, the details of truly making it an all ages and abilities street, even though it may just be a street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think signage, like you're saying, um, can make a big difference. Probably repaving those roads. Yeah, just letting people know that it's a shared space. Yeah. And that everybody it's kind of a catch-22 you don't want to make it so smooth that people just start driving faster but at the same time it you know making it clear that it's uh for people walking and biking Dayton, Kentucky. We've we've moved to a new city. Uh, happens real quick. Um, but yeah, I'm so proud of Dayton. I live in Dayton, and uh, they are really, you know, it, it makes such a difference when you have a council and a mayor that are prioritizing uh, people-powered transportation. Um, and Dayton has a lot a lot to be proud of. Yeah. So this is um, relatively new. I think within the last five years. Okay. Uh, and yeah, there was a lot of clear cutting. I think also for these homes up here, a lot of the trees were, were removed. Yeah. But that's definitely something that needs to happen next. Is like we need some shade trees down here. Yes. Um, but yeah, water has come up and covered this trail. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's another consideration when putting in the big trees. We got to make sure we put some sycamores and well, cottonwoods and. Go, Caitlin, go, Caitlin, go, Caitlin. You got this, you got this. This is your daily climb, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know that there's a walking path right up above. Yes, there. that's the levee flood wall path. Um, that's a much more narrow, it's an older trail. A lot of folks use it for walking and running. Really beautiful views of the city. Yeah, my commute's about five miles. Um, and I ride from Northern Kentucky to Cincinnati. It takes me about 30 minutes. Okay. Um, and I climb up uh, Gilbert Avenue, which is a pretty good hill. One of the, I think maybe one of the seven hills of Cincinnati, okay. um, but yeah, right up into Avondale. Pretty low stress, not bad. This is a brand new project for the city, um, this hill, you know, and I think it took a lot of negotiating with the Army Corps of Engineers who manage this uh, flood wall. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of rules about what you can and can't do with it. So yeah, we built this really steep hill <laughs> to, um, there's all sorts of new development that's a little further down the river as well. So we wanted all those people to have access to uh, downtown Dayton, which yeah. is where we're headed now. Some beautiful historic buildings, St. Bernard School. Yeah, so lovely church. Lovely with a beautiful church. rose window. On the front. Hi everybody, I'm Jay Fawcett. I'm the city administrator here in Dayton. This is Mayor Ben Baker. We, also, we also have the owner of this restaurant that's going in here. He's going to talk for a little bit. So uh, welcome, first of all, to Dayton, Kentucky. I uh, hope you're enjoying your trip here in Northern Kentucky. Um, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about this building, the history of it, what's going on with it now. We actually have a unit upstairs, the last one that is uh, for rent uh, is is open, so we're gonna. If you want to go up and look at that, it's a neat loft apartment, and then we have Mike Dew here, who's gonna op open a Wayfair Pizza here in this building here in the next few months. He's gonna talk a little bit about uh, the project here, and Ben and I are also gonna talk about uh, our trails in the city and what we're doing with those. 
But uh, let's first talk about um, this building and bid. What you want to start it off? Sure. Uh, be happy. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, first of all, welcome to Dayton, Kentucky. We are super happy to have you here, and uh, your, your, your presence is very welcomed. Uh, this building is, is a very interesting building. It's called the Burton Building. It was uh, built by a uh, man by, I forget his first name, but his last name is definitely Burton. Uh, he was a shipbuilder, and uh, right here is Berry Street. And it used to be called Ferry Street because at the base of Berry is the Ohio River. And there used to be a ferry over there that would take folks over to Cincinnati where they would work uh, and probably play too. Let me just add real quick, that was the Fulton Steamboat, Steamboat's Works right across the river. Mm -hmm. Fulton, of course, is the inventor of the steamboat and he had the largest steamboat manufacturing operation in the country Jeez. right across the river here. Yeah, it was a pretty big operation. So because of that, this, this region here became a big uh, supplier of steamboat uh, ropes and, th and workers. And so we have some of the largest rope walks in the country here. I don't know if you know what a rope walk is, but back in the day there would be, um, what do you call it, uh, marijuana plant, uh, hemp. hemp. Hemp growing all along here, and they would, uh, they would harvest that and bring it in here, and then they would, for three blocks at a time, they would wind that, that hemp through machines and make these large ropes, which would be hundreds of feet long. They'd use them on the, so in, if you, here, there, it would go across three blocks. They actually would have bridges over them so they, people could work underneath them in carriages and streetcars to go above. So uh, this city was all really industry based on the river and the river um, um, steamboat industry. Yeah, so Mr. Burton built this building back in the probably 1870s, I believe. Uh, and it's housed everything from, it was one of the, uh, like Jay mentioned, one of the first city halls for the city of Dayton. On the side of the building, you'll see it says Kroger Fine Foods. It was one of the first Kroger's in the United States. Uh, Kroger is, uh, is headquartered in Cincinnati, so Mr. Kroger had this as one of his first stores. Uh, this has been a theater. It was a uh, epiphany hall. It's for fraternal orders. It's been everything. Originally, it was an Oddfellows Hall. Oddfellows, yes. And... Uh, most recently, when I moved to the city 15 years ago, it was all boarded up, and it was a warehouse for, for carpet, and it was uh, one cigarette away from being a, a problem. And uh, so we worked with uh, some companies to, uh, to rehab it. So uh, through federal funding, we've uh, turned the upstairs into uh, 10 apartments, and since we use federal funds, this is the cool part, uh, a portion of them have to be affordable. So they can't just go up for $5,000 a month or whatever you do. It's a crazy market right now. Well, uh, four of the units are. Six of them are marketplace. Right. Market so we have to keep a portion of them uh, affordable. So that's, that's giving uh, access, accessible housing to, to everybody, which I think is really important. But uh, yeah, so this building has been a work in progress for the last uh, two years or so as we started that project. And uh, we're very happy to have Mike and his, his company about to, to start slinging some, uh, some wonderful pizzas out of here and serving our community. Uh, so you're getting a really ground floor look at that. Uh, one of the things that's really important to me is, you know, as we're working on the city's vision, you know, what we want to provide to the citizen is, is walkability. Is, you know, that's the reason that I moved here is I wanted to be able to walk to restaurants. I wanted to be able to walk to entertainment. I wanted to, uh, the truth be known, I'm a huge baseball nerd, and uh, I wanted to be able to walk to the Reds game. And, you know, we're two miles from home plate from my house. So me and my wife, we can, we can walk to a major league baseball game. How cool is that? That's cool. Yeah, so uh, you know, with, with Jay and I and our administration, we've worked really hard to add more walkability to the city. Uh, you'll notice when you're going through the city, uh, back in the 60s or so, back when the, you know cars rolled, uh, they, they shortened our sidewalks. Uh, now it's to the point where a couple can't walk down the street hand in hand, you're single file. So we worked with the state on uh, doing what's called bump outs. You're probably familiar with them. Yeah. Uh, we just did a major project this year with bump outs uh, where we had to tear up the whole main street. We installed a new uh, uh, pole lighting versus overhead lighting, which adds to a more main street feel. Uh, and we also had these bump outs. So the bump outs give an extended sidewalk and they also lessen the amount of time a pedestrian has to take when they cross the street, so increasing safety. And it also kind of, when you're driving your car, kind of makes you feel like you should be a little bit more safer, a little slower. So it's, it's, it's an extremely safe uh, project that we just completed. It was, uh, it was a headache, I'm not gonna lie, but uh, 
it's kind of like when you get in your kitchen, your bathroom, you're done. It sucks when it's happened, but when it's done, you're like, man, I sure do love that bathroom. <laughs> so, uh, man, I sure do love them bump outs. So, bump outs are really important for a number of reasons. But one, aesthetically, they're beautiful, but also they're for pedestrian safety. And so, the pedestrians can get out and see the traffic coming. We have a big problem here because we don't have to block off four or five parking spaces to create this view shed so people could see and cars could see. That just takes care of it. So we started educating people about it, and the more people get educated, the more they understood it. Um, but of course, you have people who are just like, that's a waste of money. That, that, you know, we, we get that all the time. So as he said, this used to be a Kroger store, and then it was a number of other iterations of commercial use. We're real excited about the next use. And Mike's gonna talk about it. Thanks, Jay. Thank you, Ben. Welcome, Welcome to Dayton. Um, just to give you a little backstory about me, just be real quick. Um, I've spent a large portion of my life in the city of Dayton. Uh, my great grandparents lived up the street. I went to Tacoma Pool, as was mentioned before. Um, I live in Dayton now. Um, I've been part of a restaurant group in downtown Cincinnati, OTR, for about 10 years. And, uh, you know, they say timing is everything. And I found myself in a position to open a new restaurant uh, last, last fall. And I happened to have a a nice meeting with Jay, who put me in touch with Tony, who owns the building, and things just really snowballed very quickly. Um, they were going to initially turn this into three separate uh, retail spaces, but after looking at the floor plan and thinking about what I wanted to do, I said, you know what, I'm just going to take the whole space. Uh, I think it's a beautiful space for a restaurant, clearly. You know, I'm not the type of person who wants to open a restaurant in a strip mall, like in a just a, you know, whatever, brand new build. Uh, I love character, I love the history. This feels like an over the Rhine building in, in downtown Dayton. Um, so the opportunity arose, it made it happen, um, and we're in the final stages. It's not a public announcement yet, but hopefully coming in the next week or so. Um, I've been doing pizza sales for the last eight months. Um, they've been going very well, so that gives me a lot of hope. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the city of Dayton, like I said, is a person who lives here. I want to create something here that I want to go to. Um, so this space is beautiful. Um, I have you know, experience in the restaurant industry, um, so I can bring a little bit of that expertise into Dayton and hopefully you know, make a place that people on the river and on the other side of the flood wall alike want to come and hang out at. Um, so when it comes to pizza, uh, it's, it's kind of its own thing. I've been experimenting with different styles for the last 10 years or so. and. Last fall, I started to put something new together, and it's not quite like anything you've ever had. It's like a bar-style pizza, so super thin and crispy, but if you've had Detroit-style, it's got a crispy cheese edge, and then it's cut like a square, like Midwestern tavern-style cut. So it's a, it's a nice pizza to hang out, watch some sports, drink some beer, some wine, um, have a salad, whatever. And you know, my whole thing is creating places that people want to be in. You know, it's not come in, get out, it's come in, stay a while, make this your third place that you want to hang out in. Bring it on in. So uh, thank you so much, Jay and Ben. Um, as I think I mentioned inside, uh, I live here in Dayton and it has been super easy for me to get involved with this city because our administration is just very approachable and open-minded uh, and interested in their, their local folks getting involved with their city. So the next thing that we are going to go see, um, we're just going to ride through it because we're a little short on time, but uh, it's, a, it's called a traffic garden. Uh, this project is about a, uh, less than a year old. Um, so Dayton being a city of about 6,000 people, uh, you know, the residents living just right around here, we're gonna pass the elementary school and the high school. So a lot of those students are already walking. Some of them are biking to school. Um, this traffic garden is a tool to teach our kids how to walk and bike to school safely. Um, you'll see that it's kind of like a little mini street system. Uh, we have roundabouts, stop signs, crosswalks, so that the young folks can learn how to interact with the city streets in a place that is separate from automobile traffic. 
Um, we got $25,000 to do this project, Tri-State Trails did. Uh, we worked very closely with the city, with the school, and with the Dayton Park Board to get the project uh, put together. That community connection piece was really, really important. Um, this park is unique and special because the elementary school uses it on a regular basis for their outdoor activity time. Um, and yeah, so the kids are using it and learning about traffic safety on a regular basis. And it's also open to the public, uh, which is really cool. It was a federal grant that we got. Really cool that a federal organization is interested in youth safety projects. Uh, so we're thrilled to, to put it in. We're gonna go ride through it and then we'll head to Bellevue, Kentucky, where we will talk to the mayor of Bellevue about their city, how they're making it walkable, bikeable, uh, supporting small businesses. Uh, Bellevue is celebrating uh, their uh, Bellevue and Bloom event. So there's a couple of streets closed down, lots of flowers out today. So it'll be fun to uh, be a part of that. So yeah, let's get on our bikes. And thanks again, Ben and Jay. Yeah. So here's the uh, Lincoln Elementary School. Uh, and then right down the street is the high school. And just this past year, uh, the school system bought up this property that's in between the two schools. Uh, and they're going to be building a new recreation uh, space. So a field, a track, uh, and this will be an incredible improvement for the schools. But we'll make a left here into Gillen Park. So I invite you to uh, ride the track. Very fun. The kids knew exactly what to do with it when, uh, when it was open and available to them. They, uh, they were helping each other figure it out. It was really fun. So yeah, this, uh, we had a budget of $25,000 for this project. A lot of that was, um, we did some concrete repair on the other side. Um, and then we spent about $12,000 on the paint application. It's highway grade paint, so it's gonna have a nice long shelf life. Uh, we hired a company, um, there's a lot of painting companies out there in the world, but a lot of them just do parking lots and straight lines, so ours needed to do circles, and that was like, you know, it took a little bit of digging to find that particular company, but they did an incredible job. They installed it in about two days, and, um, and yeah, we had a couple of community events before this was installed permanently, where we, we drew out uh, elements of the traffic garden with chalk. Um, and if you're interested in doing, you know, a traffic garden project, it can be as simple as that. It doesn't have to be a $25,000 uh, project. You can draw it with chalk, you can do a temporary paint. Um, but yeah, it's really an excellent space for kids to learn about traffic safety, but also opening up the world to engineering and STEM uh, classes. You know, they're thinking about how streets and cities are built and why the decisions, you know, why we made those decisions about the way we've put things together. So lots of great conversations can be had here. And yeah, and it's also right next to the Riverfront Commons Trail. So, you know, the kids are gonna learn some bike handling skills uh, and be able to, to take them out on the bigger trail and hopefully building active transportation users at a very young age and they'll carry that with them. And uh, you can learn more about our traffic garden project at tristatetrails.org. There's a QR code on our sign here. Very nice. Yeah. Nice little traffic garden. Just um, love that traffic garden. It's one of my so. favorite projects that we've done. You probably can guess the uh, portion of it that I love the best. The Where bike have, lane. With the bike lane. Yes. yes. Yep. We'll make a right turn. Yeah, it's uh, too often, so often, uh, the traffic gardens end up just being car brain yes. 
um, auto infrastructure with the kids riding bikes pretending that they're cars. Uh-huh, yep. And so I love it when uh, you see the application where there's actual bike lanes and crosswalks and stuff like that. Yes, and I think that's been kind of the, um, yeah, but I think that was like back in the day they were called safety towns or traffic, yes. um, traffic classrooms. Um, and that was exactly it. The kids were getting a kick out of driving like little miniature cars. Yep. Yep. Uh, and it wasn't really teaching them much about shared streets uh, or... Um, or how to be a pedestrian, how to be or how to ride a bike, you know, if you had a bike lane, yeah. The group that we worked with, Discover Traffic Gardens, wanted it to be more bike specific. So that, I think that's where the traffic garden came from, the idea or the name. Uh, when I was first introducing the idea, people thought we were going to build a community garden right. with like actual plants. Right. Which I suppose you could do. You could probably do a traffic garden slash community garden. Yeah, you that's, a, that's a nice mashup. <laughs> the parents can work on the community garden and the kids can uh, yeah. practice their bike handling skills. Yeah, well, and this, this project, the traffic garden project has become really popular. Uh, we, we did a, uh, a lot of communication. We talked to a lot of press. We've gotten um, the story out in a couple of national news situations. Uh, we were just put in the uh, National Road Safety, uh, it's a, a, I need to get the name for you and maybe tell you again, I, I forget, but it was a newsletter that goes out about um, federal road projects. And here's our little traffic garden being featured in it. And I've had several people reach out who are on that listserv. Um, but then neighboring cities uh, have heard about it. And we have a lot of small, cities that could really benefit from kids learning about traffic safety. So there's pop-ups that have been happening. Um, and yeah, some really good positive uh, responses to the project. Well, again, bravo. Very well done. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> at first, I didn't see the bike lanes, and I'm like, oh, no, it's just another auto-centric one. Yeah, no. Yes, so, I'm, I'm happy with those, too. Yeah. yeah, the things, we wanted a um, bike lane to be in our design. We wanted bike parking. We wanted a bus platform. We wanted specifically for our traffic garden to have a railroad crossing, because a right. few, few blocks up is an active line. We get trains through all day long. And yeah, we definitely wanted the kids to be thinking about how to cross those tracks safely. Right. But yeah, we wanted it to be something where they can learn about sharing the road with bicycles. Uh, and part of the money, and some of, the, some of these bikes were donated, but the school now has 22 bikes. Um, I think there's eight little striders, little balance bikes. Uh, we have some 16 inch and 20 inch bikes. And, um, and yeah, so they're able to bring those down to the traffic garden because not all the kids have access to bikes. Right, yeah. So that's been a real helpful thing yeah. for the school to be able to provide those. Well, and, and this is good too. You bring up a good point, especially when elementary school, um, I used to teach bike ed with fourth graders and um, I would say a significant number of them with each class didn't even know how to ride a bike yet. Yeah. So having a, a balance bike type of situation, they can work on their glide and, and get there. Yeah, that's such a big part of it is um, teaching them that they need to get that momentum first. Yes. My nieces and nephews, when they were learning, they wanted to just sit on the bike and put their feet up on the pedals right away. Right. Uh, and we're getting frustrated because they lose their balance. And yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the Strider bikes are great. Not all kids take to them, um, but they're they're really smart, uh, smart bike. That's so nice. I've lived in Dayton now for um, six years, okay. and uh, it's just gotten so much better. Uh, and like just cool projects happening. The bump outs were so encouraging. Um, I just love that. We're thinking about slowing traffic down. Um, yeah, and new businesses. Uh, we have a couple of awesome coffee shops. You're throwing a party for us. That's so yeah, we did throw a party for you. Um, oh. It just happened to be on the same day, which was really good. And it just happened to be good weather because four days ago they were saying it was going to rain and now it's just, it's gorgeous out. Yeah, yeah, so you guys picked a really good time to come. So we have some people selling plants. 
We have down at the very end showing kids how to plant, plant some plants down at the very booth down there. The W Education Foundation is down there and they're, they're teaching kids about plants and that, how good they are. And like on these streets here, we've planted a lot of these trees going all the way up these streets and when they, when they die, we've been replacing a lot. Since I've been mayor in 2019, we've replaced hundreds of these trees and got them, got them in here, which makes it nice. This is my life. So I've lived within three blocks of this corner my whole life. I own the jewelry store, which is in this block, right in the middle of this block. I used to own the jewelry store, I sold it. Now the fourth generation owns it. I used to live, my dad's house was across the street. My house is down where we're going down the street. I'm three houses to right, right of Darkness Brewery. So, and then when I was real little, I lived on the street above this one. So I've been right here my whole life and I've seen a big change in Bellevue. I remember back in the 70s, this town was alive. Um, this was the color corner right here. And then, the, so there was all these little, the hardware store, the butcher, the baker. I mean, you just go up the street and I can name you what the old place was. And there was not just one butcher, there was two. There was, there was only one baker, but there was three grocery stores. There was, there was so many places and the avenue was alive. And then all of a sudden the big box stores started coming out. And one by one, and the like, 1990s, early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, everything started to fail. Now like Snyder's Ice Cream and our jewelry store has been there since 1932, there since 1939. And those places held up, but the ones that were hardware stores, grocery stores, all of them, they couldn't compete in price and people just jumped ship. So then in 2003, they had the Main Street program here um, in the state of Kentucky. And so they said, if we would join the Main Street program, that was 2002, we, they would, you could get grant money to get different things in your city. And we said, well, let's go for it because we wanted to improve our Main Street, which was this, these blocks down right through here. And so we went for it and I became president the first year. I said, well, let's walk this thing and see what the 10 worst buildings are. So. We walked the avenue, picked out the 10 worst buildings, and when I got back, I said, I noticed that like seven of them or so are for sale. I said, we should personally buy them. Whoever can afford to buy a building, buy one. I bought the worst one. Another guy bought three of them that were three for one money for sale because they were so bad, they were falling down. And we bought six of them in a short period of time. And by doing that same thing, we bought all the worst buildings, and I wound up buying actually about a total of eight of them. And over the time from 2000 and that up till, I quit buying them about in 2015 or so, or 2012. But we would fix them all up and make them the nicest buildings. And also then we could control who went in them. So if we were leasing them, some of them, the person was going into them that bought the building. But on my case, I was looking for people to go into them and not putting smoke stores and not putting phone stores and, and keeping all them out. And this is my marketing director, Melissa Morandi. Melissa is now helping me with the city. She's worked for us for five years, is it? Four, okay. And we actually go around and try and get whoever we want in a store now. So we went around about six months ago and decided we went over the Rhine, we go to Covington, we put a team of people that went there and we saw, we would like one of these clothing stores that these young kids like, you know, vintage clothing shop. So we put the word out and right now it's, it's in this block, the vintage clothing shop is, is in my building in this block because I fixed it all up the way they needed it so they could, they could have the rent they needed too and, and did it. And then the baker here, the breadsmith, I've been trying to get him to come to Bellevue. I gave him my other building here real cheap and he's gonna, he's gonna fix it up and he's going in there soon. So by the end of the year, I'm gonna have a baker back in Bellevue. And that's what, we've been proactive to get the people we want and it really works for helping our city to make it where you can walk up and down and go to more shops that people like. You don't have to look for them. Yes. You mentioned you had like you and you know five, ten other people. Was it? Have you guys developed some type of like group or corporation? Oh yes. Yeah. So no, months? it's not. We're not hooked by anything other than the the Inview Business Group. It was. It was called Renaissance back then. And then we changed it to Inview in about 2015. But it was the people that owned all the businesses were the ones doing it. It was not non-business owners.
Hey Charlie, is there, um, do you know how long darkness has been in town and what kind of difference that's darkness made? started, they, they didn't move from somewhere else. They came here, I don't know, it's only been four or five years ago. It's not very long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, um, so the one guy that's a partner in, one of the one guys that invested in it, he was down at Virgil's restaurant in Bellevue. You know, he went before he came up here and was part of this. Yeah. And so, yeah, they just got together, these guys, and just started it. <laughs> cool. Awesome. One thing that we were going to discuss was the, the trails. You talked about a new kayak put in and, right. uh, you know, developing the Riverfront Commons Trail and other park projects. So one of the things that bothers me about Bellevue, I got this great asset, the river. Yes. And I'm not connected to it anymore. When I was a kid, um, right down the bottom of this street here, you could go down there and Brickings Boat Harbor was there and they went down that way like four blocks and they went that way about six blocks and they took up the whole riverfront and you could access the river anytime you wanted to and you could put a boat in, you could do everything in Bellevue. They had down here in these blocks further down a little bit past the boat harbor, people had rope swings to get into the river. And, and it was so good. And then little by little, the riverfront property became so valuable that it all got bought up. It was really cheap property. And that's, that's what I should have been buying is the riverfront property because stuff that um, you could buy for $10,000 when I was younger buying these places up here, all of a sudden, yeah, they went, all of a sudden the lots went way up because they built like the big building there. And now our development that we're doing is right at this corner. So our riverfront development it starts right at this intersection and that first building there in the Assured Partners, it's coming down. That's going to be right there on the front. There's going to be like five businesses in the front here on that corner. And the next lot over between here and UDF is going to be a 105 room hotel right here on the avenue. And they said that'll bring 100 new people a day to the avenue by having that 105 room hotel here because they think with all we, we've going on here, um, it's going to be 90% occupied. It's, it's going to keep a real high occupancy rate because we have so much to offer for people to walk up and down here. And then going down this street to the river, there's going to be like right now the plan calls for 14 attached condos or attached single family, whatever you want to term them. But those are going to average a million each and they go down and make an L. And then in the middle of it, there's going to be um, like 160 apartments in that part. That's, that's what's new coming real soon. And that'll add a lot more people to the avenue here. Um, but, but I want to get the things I've been working on. And I had my kayak launch on an America the Beautiful grant. And I was the number six person on that grant. And what happened was the other ones at the beginning of it, which they had more important things that they had put down and they, they didn't figure their pricing right, thought it would cost 800,000 and it was like one and a half million to do the first thing that David Wicks had. So he, they, they got a big share of it. By the time it got down, the last two things got canceled off because all the money, the $6 million they had went to the first four projects or so. And then I lost my grant to get my kayak launch, but I wanted to at least have that to get hooked to the river. Then I'm working on trying to put um, a fishing pier too, right at our beach park. And I want to connect us to Dayton um, real soon to finish the piece of the puzzle for the um, Riverfront Commons. I've, I've been on the Riverfront Commons committee even before I was mayor. I was trying to do stuff along the river and hook the trails up and they asked me to be, South Bank Partners asked me to be on that, that committee because I was always right. interested in that. It's a mile walk here to a downtown theater in Cincinnati. It's yes. And from here, it's less than two miles to all the convention centers, all the sports teams, the Reds, the Bengals, FC Cincinnati. All that's less than two miles from right here. And a lot of people walk it. And I get paid 4000 a year for being the mayor. And I work 40 to 50 hours a week doing all this stuff. But I love it. It's fun. Well done. Yeah, it is it's a lot of fun. Um, so we were excited to get it. And it's been amazing to have so many folks in town and talking about active transportation and um, yeah, public infrastructure. So it's been nice to show people that we are a bicycling region. Some folks get a little intimidated because we have a lot of hills around here. Um, but you know, these, these red bikes are just amazing. They're such a great resource 
they make climbing a hill no no problem at all. Yeah, they're such a, joy, a fun fun bike to ride. What's the story with this bridge? They call this the Big Mac Bridge. <laughs> because of the color? Yeah, because the color and it's kind of like McDonald's M, M. shape. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's got the arches, yeah. At yeah. this angle, you can see two arches. <laughs> but this is our uh, 471 bridge. It connects to 275, the loop that goes around the Cincinnati region. Yeah. Are there any bike ped facilities on that one? No. Okay. Just Are interstate. Are we going the wrong way? No. <laughs> He's joking. Oh, is he going the wrong way? Yeah. I see. The Taylor Southgate, and we're going to go up on this sidewalk here. Okay. The Taylor Southgate Bridge does have a really nice big sidewalk, um, but that's one of the few. I guess the Roebling Suspension Bridge has walking paths on both sides. Yep. And I do see people uh, riding it for commute. Yes. You can ride on that deck too. It doesn't make everybody feel super comfortable. Right. It's just kind of a weird surface. Yeah, yeah. And it can be slippery. We do trail counting on this bridge. Oh, you do? Um, I'm pretty sure we do. That's one of the things that Tri-State Trails offers to our member organizations, people yeah. who hire us. Uh, we help them with their pedestrian and cycling plans and help them find funding, but also Oh gosh, that scared me. I thought that was a red bike crashing. Um, but yeah, we also do trail counting, which is great data to advocate for more, right. more infrastructure. Yeah. yeah. More trails. I also notice here too, if we swing around to the camera and take a look, you know, we've got a fair amount of housing and uh, hotel activity here. Yeah. So it's, it's really neat to see some uh, dynamic richness to the, uh, the environment. Yes, Newport on the Levee is a big entertainment space. It has uh, changed and adapted in a couple of ways. Uh, thank you all. <laughs> Appreciate it. Sorry, we're a big group. <laughs> but there's a movie theater in there. Um, this is all condo, apartment, living. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of new development on the other side of the levee. Where's Will at? Hey, Will. You're our last stop for the day. Yeah, so we would love to learn more about the Riverfront Commons Trail and yeah, and other work that South Bank Partners is, is doing. Perfect, Yeah. perfect. See if I saw any familiar faces from uh, Breakfast on the Bridge. Yeah, the bridge is that way. Uh, awesome, so welcome to the Purple People Bridge. Uh, my name is Will Weber, so I'm the president of the nonprofit that owns this bridge behind me. And pardon me, I'm also the DJ at the moment, so just let me go ahead and pause that. There we go. So that is the, one of the cool parts of the job. Um, so like I said, um, the president of the company that owns the Purple People Bridge, we are actually the only nonprofit that owns a bridge that crosses the Ohio River and probably very few throughout the country. So uh, very unique, and the reason it is a pedestrian bridge uh, back in 2003, the transportation cabinet deemed this bridge redundant from a vehicular standpoint and they planned to demolish it. <laughs> well, the city of Newport said this would be a really neat project to keep uh, pedestrian only, It'd be a really neat placemaking tool. And with the help of South Bank Partners, which is the other hat I wear, um, the founders of that organization, which is a regional nonprofit uh, in the regional economic development organization that is a nonprofit, worked with the city of Newport to actually get this bridge deeded over to be managed, hopefully in perpetuity, by a nonprofit and keep it open for pedestrian use. Uh, if you see behind me, uh, it's actually closed today. There was a private event last night. So the sole source of revenue for the bridge actually comes from renting it as an event venue. Very unique business model and hopefully one we can enhance. You can only imagine how many events one can have in a year to help support a bridge as, as 150 years old. Uh, but it's really neat uh, model that way. Uh, I wish you could bike over the, the main portion, uh, but hopefully if you're still in town tomorrow, we'll have it open here in the next two or three hours. Um, I know Caitlin wanted me to talk a little bit about Riverfront Commons. So Riverfront Commons is the signature project of South Bank Partners. I mentioned a little bit that South Bank Partners is this regional economic development organization that worked with the city of Newport. We also, we, excuse me, we also serve six other cities in our region. So you just visited two of them, Bellevue and Dayton, uh, down this way. Uh, if you were to go further around the bend of the river, there's the city of Fort Thomas and Silver Grove. And if you continue down this way, uh, we also serve uh, the city of Covington and Ludlow. 
Kentucky. So in total, we have seven cities we serve, and Riverfront Commons is a greenway project, 20 miles of multi-use pass that would connect from an overlook in Covington called DeVue Park. It probably has the best view of downtown Cincinnati you can find in the region, all the way along the riverfront until you get to Silver Grove and Pendry Park. So 20 miles on this side of the river. Uh, I know Caitlin and her organization, Tri-State Trails, uh, work very hard at a project very similar called The Crown in Cincinnati, and that is 34 34 miles. So all in all, uh, in our region, our goal is to have this interconnected 50 plus mile network. Uh, we always compare ourselves to, you know, what's that gold standard in the country? And we've been gravitating more and more to um, Bentonville, Arkansas, and what the Razorback Greenway has accomplished. And we thought if we can continue to work with what we have here in the region to get to that level, then we've got something special for folks like you all to come visit. Um, in addition, with uh, South Bank Partners in this regional economic development, uh, we're not your typical uh, traditional industrial commercial economic development organization that's recruiting those type of firms. Uh, we're more akin to like a downtown partnership. So I know this gentleman mentioned he's from Austin. Some of the larger cities in the country have a particular downtown partnership. And the best way to explain that one is if all of these cities got together and they shared public works, they shared parks and recreation, they shared uh, main streets, downtown development and put it all into one bucket and said what could we do to really make this community connected and vibrant and resilient to be a true destination and that's what we've been able to serve uh, our communities for the last 25 plus years with South Bank Partners. Uh, very excited um, for the future we have here. I know I th believe you were able to visit uh, Fairfield Avenue, Darkness Brewing. So that is probably one of the quintessential downtowns that you'll be able to experience here of the uh, architecture, the small mom and pop shops, but also that revitalization you saw coming back to the urban core. And that's really our specialty with South Bank Partners. Um, I don't know how much you've been able to learn about the Northern Kentucky side of the river. Uh, obviously, we have the, the Queen City behind me here. But in Northern Kentucky, you have all these smaller communities. We actually have almost 40 cities in three counties. And I look at it and say, with any particular area in the country, you've got an urban area, you got a little suburban area, and you got the rural piece. South Bank Partners, we specialize just in the urban core. We want to create a very vibrant urban core that complements what the, the Queen City of Cincinnati has in our region. So really excited and glad that you all could stop by and check out the Purple People Bridge and hopefully ride a little bit more on Riverfront Commons and uh, the Ohio River Trail of the Crown Project. All right, y'all. Um, thank you so much, Will. That was really great. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, we're all running. Oh, yes, yes, yes. It's a really cool spot. bid in for funding to have these tracks pulled up. Um, they are really interesting and you know and it's like in some ways I'd love to see them remain uh, because they're a you know, historic thing and talks about our history of rail travel. Um, but so many people have fallen on these tracks and some very serious injuries have happened. They're incredibly slippery uh, even on like these scooters that this little one's on. You have to be really, really cautious. Um, so we were thinking, like, if we pulled them up, uh, repair the concrete, but maybe put something in that, like, memorializes the tracks, perhaps with, like, a different color concrete or a brick or something like that that could still acknowledge the history, but it would make this trail so much safer. Yeah. So uh, earlier uh, you mentioned the crown. Talk a little bit about uh, that project. Yeah, that project's um, one of the biggest projects that Tri-State Trails is working on. Um, I'd say like it was officially launched in 2020 uh, with a fundraising campaign. Uh, we raised $12 million. But yeah, the crown stands for uh, Cincinnati Riding or Walking Network. When it's finished, it'll be 34 miles of connected off-road multi-use trail. Um, I think the vision started because we have 
We have some incredible trails in Cincinnati. Uh, the Little Miami Scenic Trail is one that was mentioned when we were talking in Dayton, and that trail will take you all the way to the top of the state. Um, it'll be, it's a 364, I think, ish mile trail of contigu contiguous off-road multi-use trail. So our Crown Trail connects to that. Um, and yeah, so we have these little pieces of trail in different parts of town, and we thought, let's build new trail to make these connections. I think it was, I'm not sure exactly when these highways were built, but when they were, they divided a lot of our communities. Um, highways just straight, straight through residential areas. So transportation around here, sometimes it feels like you have to have a car to get around. So this trail kind of meets the needs of folks who don't own a car. 20% uh, of Cincinnati's population does not own a car. Uh, there's uh, a lot of senior citizens, just folks that don't want to drive a car, um, all sorts of folks anyway. Um, and, and yeah, so it's good. It's going to be a great resource for transportation. This is our mural about. <laughs> I totally forgot to mention that. That's our mural for the crown. Um, but yeah, so we have about 18 and a half miles of it finished. And uh, yeah, big, a big piece of it is uh, over on the west side, the piece that we're currently working on. And this is very much in the preliminary phase where we are just like, we've been going to community council meetings, uh, talking to local leaders about, uh, about trails, just telling them like, this is what this trail could bring to your community. Trying to get as much public input right now and community support um, so that we're not just like coming in and building a trail uh, that people maybe don't want or uh, that they you know don't don't think that they need um, so yeah on the west side we're, we're working on building that trail with the community uh, and it's it's another situation where where we're working with an old rail line uh, to convert it to a trail um, and so, yeah, we're in conversations with railroad companies on the west side piece. And, uh, and yeah, so it's moving forward a little bit at a time. Uh, folks always ask us when it's going to be finished. And I think... Anticipation. Yes, I think, uh, you know, we're getting, like, we get, we get little sections done at a time. And that's, that's, that's been pretty great. I think... Um, the, the tour that we did on Thursday, we explored the Wasson Way section of the Crown, uh, which is all new trail. About five miles have been built since 2020. Um, and yeah, we're breaking ground on, on that like at least once a year. Uh, so yeah, it's work in progress. Um, really incredible campaign. The 12 million was private and uh, public money that was raised. We got couple of big million dollar uh, donations from large corporations in town and then just individuals and small businesses who wanted to see the trail built have uh, kicked in and helped build it which is pretty amazing. That's fabulous and I noticed that we're rolling right past the uh, Bengals uh, stadium here uh, pretty comfortable it seems like being able to walk or bike uh, to the stadium we heard about that quite a bit over on the other side of the river yeah. is that uh, there is that level of appreciation that, hey, well, it'd be silly to drive there. Let's just walk or bike there. Yes. Yes, that's very true. Um, and these stadiums, you know, this is definitely a sports town and people love coming over here. It's very, uh, yeah, lots of committed fans for Bengals and the Reds. Um, so, yeah, it's a great option to be able to walk instead of, you know, there's, there's parking here, but I'm sure it's very expensive and uh, yeah. traffic gets very congested. Um, well, that's the beauty of, of walking and biking is you can you can move so many more units. You can get, a, you can get a, yeah, get away from that. Yeah, yeah. And I also note the the wonderful protected bikeway right in front of the MLS stadium. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Yeah. You know, fantastic addition. Yeah, that was really amazing. Um, that was a huge construction project. Um, and you know, and like so many construction projects, it feels like there's always like some pros and cons. Um, there's been a lot of uh, development on the west side of Cincinnati, which is predominantly black neighborhood, low income. So a lot of housing was removed for that stadium. Um, some, you know, long-standing businesses 
Uh, but now it's, you know, it's like this world ca class kind of structure of uh, sports, you know, bringing lots of people into town, um, hopefully helping some of the local folks uh, benefit from that, those new folks visiting. Um, but yeah, it's nice that when they put that, when they were building it, that they were also considering people walking to that stadium. And usually on game days, they will close down the whole street in front of it because there is so much foot traffic. Oh, wild. I wish I would have known that. <laughs> game day was a couple days ago, and uh, where I'm staying, the, the, the local place was just packed with people getting, going to the game. Yes, so. yeah, my camp, the Camp Washington tour on Wednesday, we rode through that. Very cool. We want to do like community oriented trail building. Yeah. Um, sometimes trails can be like an indicator of gentrification. Right, yeah. Um, that's what I mean. Uh, you know, I like to talk about our west side, west side of Cincinnati trail building and just let folks that know that that is like our intention. Uh, we want to make sure that it's an equitable trail, that it's influenced by community input and um, and yeah so like we don't want to gentrify the west side right we want to exactly. enhance it so that folks who live there now uh, will have a great yeah great amenity right in their right in their backyards right and hopefully be able to, to stay yes <laughs> be able to stay exactly yeah you guys are all set Excellent. thanks Excellent. for hanging out a little extra long yeah no, that's a long day Get yourself some lunch. Hey folks, big round of applause for Caitlin, the rest of the guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much. <laughs>